Pastor Adrian for inviting me here again today. Uh, when, when we got here and there were three or four people here, I thought I'd scare them all away from last week. Obviously not everyone was scared. During worship, um, uh, something really quite significant happened for me. Um, I began to see things that I hadn't seen for a long time in a church service. The line of the tribe of Judah was over there. Aslan was there. And in this corner, there was a huge angel. And we were surrounded by angels. And I began to shake. And shake and shake. I don't know if anyone noticed, but I was shaking quite profoundly. So something was up. Something is up this morning. God is in the house. The Holy Spirit is here. And he wants to accomplish something among us today. I personally want to welcome uh, my friend Gordon here today, and uh, and Liz. Uh, they're from uh, previous church that we we pastored, and, and Raymond was from that church, and also Lois and Stuart. And you you may find that during the service that um, Gordon will manifest powerfully. He may not, but he may. I'm just going to tell you that in case you're alarmed. He's not demonized. He doesn't have a demon. The Holy Spirit comes upon him. He's very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. And, and what, is that, what God is actually doing is offending any religious spirit that might be in the room. That's what's really happening. They may well have all have been cleaned out of this church. I don't know. But that's, that's the deal. So I'm very honoured to be here and uh, to continue this series around the manifest presence and power of Holy Spirit. Um, Pastor Adrian asked me to address two things today. Uh, understanding the Holy Spirit moved during the service. He certainly moved on me. And secondly, how to catch the Holy Spirit when he's flowing in a gathering. Not to be a spectator, but a partaker and a participant. A very good friend of mine would ask the question of a service like this. What is the wine on today? What is the wine on today? The wine of the Spirit. Is he on the worship? Is he on a word of testimony? Is he on a prophetic word? Is he on the preaching? Is he just in the silence? The wine is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. My own sense today is that the anointing was on the worship. It was a powerful worship time. And I really appreciate it now. Ellen and Ruth and the, and the team for their worship today. What is the anointing on? And wherever his anointing is, how do we respond to him? I think I want to say something else before I start. Um, we didn't have a change of government last night. Oh yes, we had a change of government in the nation. Uh, but the government of the kingdom <coughs> remains. Uh, it's a kingdom that will never end. And the king is still on the throne. And I would like to encourage you to be far more cognizant of and more concerned about and think a whole lot more about and give a whole lot more room uh, to the kingdom of God than worrying about the government of the nation. Amen. The other thing I want to say is that you may not be happy with the result. But we're called, uh, God chose the new Prime Minister. Amen. So we're called to bless them Amen. and his government Amen. and pray for him. Yes. And I encourage you to do that. We have a great nation. We're part of the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. And although Raymond and I had a disagreement this morning, Australia is not going down the drain. It's not going down the tubes. It's not being destroyed. It's part of the kingdom 
whose government is increasing and will never end. Jesus. <laughs> We're part of a great nation. The prophetic words over this great nation are amazing. And we want to walk in those words. That's just a throwaway line when it comes for free. The Holy Spirit is sovereign. And in a gathering like this, he will move on whatever or whoever he chooses. And will bring glory and honour to Jesus. Amen. He always uh, causes us to to, uh, to take our attention, to put, take, put our eyes on Jesus, to pay attention to him and to lift him up. So we lift up the name of Jesus today as the Holy Spirit moves in this place. Rodney Howard Brown, some of you may know that name, is a present-day revivalist, and he was holding a huge meeting on the east coast of the US in the 90s. And it was the night that the angels came. It's on uh, YouTube if you want to look at it. The angels came and sang extraordinarily and for a very long time. And in the midst of the wonder and the glory and the noise and the excitement and the laughter and the tears, he kept saying, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. And when Holy Spirit comes and does stuff, he wants us to keep our eyes on Jesus. Keep our eyes on Jesus. This morning, I have a few scriptures, but primarily I'm going to tell you stories. Um, I heard a preacher just a couple of weeks ago say, I could unload a whole lot of theology on you this morning, and you won't remember any of it. But if I tell you some stories, you'll probably remember them all. And so that's what I'm doing this morning. I'm taking a leaf out of his book. In July, um, no, back in 1994, down in Geelong, there was a little uniting church. It had been a Methodist church. And it was at the time when the Toronto Blessing was starting to happen around the world, and particularly in Australia. And one morning... In this little church, I know the pastor well, in this little church, Holy Spirit came. And it's like he went straight down the middle of the church. On one side, everyone was on the floor either crying or laughing or yelling or manifesting something. And on the other side, they were just sitting up straight and nothing was happening. Very interesting move of Holy Spirit. He is sovereign. He'll do what he wants. Amen. Suddenly, in, in July 2007, I might have told you this story before. In July 2007, on a Saturday morning at the church I was pastoring at Hillview, we met for a prophetic equipping weekend. And the church was packed. And uh, we were having worship, and the worship really wasn't going very well. There were two girls singing, and they were very nervous that morning. And my wife nudged me and said, John, they're coming. The evangelist said, they're coming. And suddenly, and I'll say suddenly, uh, she saw a whole line of horses across the stage. That was what she saw. And suddenly they raised, the, the angels on the horses raised their standards and came through the building from front to back with an indescribable noise. I can't describe the noise. But the majority of the people were on the floor weeping and shouting. It was indescribable. The meeting was hijacked by the Holy Spirit as the hosts of heaven came in. We abandoned the meeting and tried to process what was happening. A lady was out, one of the ladies from the church was out picking up the lunches. It was kind of late morning and she'd gone out to pick up the lunches. And she got back to the church and she could hear the worship. So she gathered everything up and walked into the church. And the worship had long finished. So she walked outside again and said, she could hear the worship. So she walked in again, and we had long finished. 
And she walked, she did it three times. And she realized that over the building, the angels were worshipping. Amazing sound of angels worshipping over the building. It had truly been a visitation that morning and changed our church forever. It ushered in that event, ushered in a Holy Spirit outpouring that went for around 16 months with meetings four to six months a week. Why am I telling these stories today? Why do we tell stories? Well, the scripture says in Revelation 12, verse 11, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. You see, the anointing is on your story. You realize that? Your life story has an anointing on it. It's called history. His story. There's an anointing on your story, on your testimony. And it's a most powerful anointing. Most of us, have, we either feel embarrassed by our story, or we don't think our story counts. We don't think we count. We don't think anybody would be interested. But it's part of what God has placed in us to share with the world. There's an anointing on your story. I ask myself, why did the Holy Spirit come in such power that day in July 2007? And the answer is, we were hungry. We were really hungry for His presence. We were so hungry for His presence. We constantly honoured His presence and invited His presence. Continually reminding ourselves of the scripture I quoted to you last week. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy and pleasures at His right hand forevermore. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy and pleasures at His right hand forevermore. In the environment of His presence, there are signs, wonders and miracles. It's amazing. It's amazing to be immersed in that atmosphere. It's like, I can't believe this is happening. Because we didn't do anything to deserve it, but we were hungry. And we invited him, and we honoured him. And he came. One night a lady came in to one of our night meetings, and she walked in on crutches. I can kind of still see it. And at the end of the service, the, the, at the end of the meeting, the guy who was preaching um, said, well, we're going to pray for everyone now. If you want to be prayed for, you know, just, just stand up. And in our meetings, we would put all the chairs to the side walls and people would <coughs> line up their lines across the building. And this lady, whose name I can't remember now, stood there and I prayed for her. And she just crashed to the floor and stayed there for a long time, and that, that was it. We prayed for lots of other people. But the next night she came back. But she didn't come in on crutches, she walked in. <coughs> and during the service, the, the preacher we had said, does anyone have a testimony? And she put up her hand and she walked to the front. And she said, yesterday, I couldn't walk without crutches. But today, after being prayed for last night, today, I've walked through every shopping centre I could possibly go to <laughs> without crutches, and I walked in here tonight without crutches. I, I was totally healed. And all I did was touch her. I, I sort of remember I just touched her on the forehead. But the Holy Spirit did this amazing healing. Another lady came, and she had been up in... Uh, up in Fertry Gully, and she met a man and he said, um, you should go down to that little church down in Roeville. They're having people healed down there. And uh, her name's Diane, and she said, I've never heard of it. And her story was that she worked for a city life church. And, and they were having building uh, works there. 
and she tripped over something and she shattered her leg and she was in very serious trouble. The, the bone was shattered and after many operations and in constant excruciating pain, she wore a brace, a special stocking and walked with a stick and limped. So she decided to come to the meeting that night. And when it came to ministry time, she stood up in the middle of the, the hall. And we had, we had two special speakers at that time. And both of them prayed for her. And the pain got worse. And she walked to the side of the building and kind of just crashed on some chairs. And then she went home. Her husband Peter took her home. The next morning, she sat up in bed and got out of bed to go to the toilet. And she said, I can't do that. And she sat on the side of the bed and put both her legs out. And her leg was like that. But she put both her legs out and they were both straight. She had no pain. And she was totally healed. And, and there were times she said, I, I, I just wanted to die because the pain was so bad. She was totally healed. She was a um, work cover case. So she went back to the doctors and they couldn't find anything wrong with her. But because she was a, a case and they'd funded so much, they wanted to operate to fix it. But there was nothing to fix. She was totally healed. Dying was totally healed. And, and ultimately... Uh, she came and worked, I had a business, she came and worked for us for a number of years. So we were able to uh, know her testimony was real, it was powerful, and she told many people what God had done for her. Holy Spirit came and touched her life. Angels often came during worship. We could hear the angels. There might have been a hundred people in the room, but there was like a thousand people as the angels came and sang. A pastor from uh, down on the peninsula had had major leg pain for many, many years. His name's David, David Whitby. And he came one day when John Arnott was there, the other John Arnott. And John prayed for him. He's never had pain since. He had serious pain, no more pain. He said to me quite recently, I'm still healed. I still don't have any pain. In his presence... Many things happen. <coughs> Hearts are healed from life's hurts. Uh, people are healed from shame and shock and trauma. They deal with their forgiveness issues. And many have found that when they deal with their forgiveness issues, they're healed. The, the unforgiveness kind of holds, the, holds whatever it is in, and when they forgive, healing comes. When we encounter Him, in his presence, there is transformation. You know, today you sang an amazing song. I would have liked to have preached straight after that song. Because you were making a declaration of when the Holy Spirit comes, what he does. So you should keep singing that song. It's like an invitation from Holy Spirit. The encounter makes the difference. You know, you can have the best preaching all your life. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm not against preaching or teaching. It is essential in the kingdom that we're well taught. The Holy Spirit moves through anointed preaching. But an encounter empowers you. The teaching equips you, but the encounter empowers you. You're actually touched by God. The preaching kind of touches your mind, but the encounter touches your spirit and brings a profound change. During 2007, sorry, during the preceding time to 2007 when we had the outpouring, we prayed regularly for a visitation 
for the Holy Spirit and for his manifest presence. We couldn't wait to get to prayer meetings to see what God would do in that prayer meeting. We couldn't wait to get to church on a Sunday morning. Yes. And we didn't want to miss it. Just, we didn't want to be away just, be, just in case we missed something that he did. There was such an expectation and an excitement in the place that any day now, God will do amazing stuff. Going back a couple of years, I'd gone to a conference in Adelaide. Um, Heidi and Roland Baker were the speakers, I think, at that conference. And the Lord spoke to me in 2005 and said, John, contend for my presence. So I came back from Adelaide, drove back. Contend for my presence. Push in for my presence. Go for my presence. Above all else, contend for my presence. So when I got back, we, we usually had a leadership team meeting um, late in January, and I would go and cook with spreadsheets and um, notes and all manner of things about our plans for the year. And I went to the meeting and said, guys, I, I don't have any paperwork. We don't have a plan. The only plan we have is the one the Lord gave me, contend for my presence. Mm -hmm. And so we began. We, we suspended all programs, but for contending for his presence. So we had, we prayed, we soaked in his presence, and we worshipped. And he came powerful. It's like push until he comes. During the latter part of 2006, I felt the Lord say to me one day, I might have shared this already, um, John, I want you to resign as senior pastor of the church. And I want you to hand over to the Holy Spirit. Which was kind of a radical thing to do. <laughs> so I did that. Sunday morning, this particular day, I said, folks, um, the Lord has spoken to me and he's asked me to resign. <coughs> and he's asked me to hand over the senior pastor role to Holy Spirit. So I, I went through that. Holy Spirit, I resign as senior pastor of this church and I hand over that role to you. And I stood back. Now nothing happened at that moment, but it was like something happened in the spirit. And guess what? He believed me. He believed me. So we continued to pray, to worship, to soak in his presence, we invited special anointed speakers every two or three months. And you could say that all of this raised the water level of the Holy Spirit in the place. Did everyone like it? No. Not everyone. But Jesus liked it. And the majority of the people embraced what he was doing. Religious spirits departed. And expectations grew. Um, I had the joy of having, I think, about six or seven people in the church at that time. And they would sit in the front row. They'd walk in together of a Sunday morning. They'd all sit in the front row and get out their notebooks and pens. And they would write down every word I said. <laughs> I called them the religious mafia. <laughs> And, and, you know, when you've got them in your front row and you're preaching, it, it's very difficult. It's like you've got a big wall there. But anyway, we continued. And one day they took me aside and said, we need to meet with you. So I met with them that afternoon in their house. And they said, we don't like what you're doing. And we want you to leave. And I said to them, well... I'm actually not going anywhere. It's probably a good idea if you have. And, and I can tell you, yeah, two or three really good churches that you could go to, but you need to understand I'm not for changing. I have a mandate, I have a commission, I have an instruction, we're contending for its presence. Doesn't matter what it costs. Doesn't matter whether you like it or not. He is coming. Oh yeah, but when? He is coming. He is coming, 
and you will. Hallelujah. And they left. That was a lot more comfortable. <laughs> and you know, I've met them since. And they've each apologised. I said, sorry, John. We got it so wrong. We're really sorry. Those are difficult. Religious spirits are killers. Yeah, They're absolute killers, you know that. <coughs> Back into 2007, as the, as the outpouring increased, we began to get calls from quite outstanding speakers from around the world, particularly the UK, the US and Canada. And as a result of them coming, the church was built up, there was tremendous blessing, there were more miracles, great encouragement and, and increase in anointing. And I calculated that during the time of that outpouring, about 16 months, something like 25,000 people came through our little church of about 100. Now, they might have been the same people, but that's the, how many bodies came through in that time. <coughs> Extended meetings and a revival can be very expensive. Uh, we were paying, I think, each night $650 a night, six nights a week when we were doing six nights, plus airfares, plus accommodation. I said to a friend of mine, how? And his name is Nuno. Nuno, how do you fund this? How does this work? Like, we've got money in the bank, but is it going to last? And his words to me were, he, he'd come out of Toronto, he knew the Toronto Revival, he said, John, the anointing will fund the revival. And we, we were never short of money. And we had huge bills, never short of money. There was always more than enough. The anointing will fund the revival. His presence in your church, the anointing that that brings, will fund anything he wants you to do. You won't have to worry about anything. He will fund it. So the anointing is on your story. The anointing is on this story. The anointing is on your story. It's a powerful indication that God honours as we honour Him and recognise Holy Spirit and give Him space to move and allow Him to manifest His presence. Reminding you of the scripture again, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, a few other strong stories. Is this all right? Mm -hmm. um, the revival in, in Toronto began on January the 20th, 1994, with about 70 people in a room, a little church at the end of the Toronto International Airport Runway. And um, Randy Clark was the preacher that night. He'd not preached many sermons, and he hadn't preached many sermons one after another. And he was asked to be there for a week, I think. And on the first night he preached, asked people to come forward for prayer, and the rest is really history. Everyone was on the ground, and the revival began from that moment. Uh, and ultimately they bought a building that held 5,000 people and that revival went from January the 20th, 1994 to I think it was June the 30th, 2012 uh, six nights a week that's enormous commitment but that's what happened in that time, and they stopped counting at one point 5 million people had come through the building in that time. When they first started, uh, it wasn't long before there were, I think it was five jumbo jets of people coming out of England every week to come to the revival. There were thousands of miracles. And then the Toronto revival exploded around the world and it really impacted pretty well every nation and churches in every nation. And of the four major revivals in uh, in the 20th century, uh, Toronto was number four to massive revival. And so it's touched thousands of people, touched us. 
Touch Gordon. Touch many of us. Liz, many of us. Change forever. We've never been the same since. It causes us to be quite fearless. We don't care what people think of us. We're not rude or unkind, but we don't. We're not embarrassed. We're not embarrassed. We love what God has done and is doing. Have you all heard of Roland and Heidi Baker? Yeah. Okay. Well, Roland and Heidi Baker, they had been missionaries in Mozambique. I forget how many years. I'll say it was 10, but it might have been less. And they had, in that time, they had planted 10 churches. And they were worn out. In fact, they were burnt out. And they went back to the US. And the person who was funding them said, um, when you go back, I've got a million dollars ready to give you for your ministry. On one condition, don't you go to that place that starts with the letter T. <laughs> if you go there, there's no money. Well, they were desperate. They were desperate for something to happen in their lives because they had completely run out of steam. I remember hearing Heidi bring this testimony and she said, oh, and she's a, um, a doctor of divinity and she's got all sorts of all sorts of credentials. She said, I just want to go and work in Kmart. I have just had enough. So they went to Toronto, uh, sitting in the back, hoping no one would ever notice. And this guy who, who said, don't go there, would never know. Well, John Arnott recognised them. He knew them and, and invited them to the front. And they were on the, get, got them up to the stage as he does and you know, interviewed them so the whole world saw them up there. <laughs> that night, uh, during the ministry time, Heidi was prayed for. And she had a profound encounter with Holy Spirit. And she was on the floor for seven days. She'd come in the morning. Uh, her, her helpers would take her to the bathroom during the day. Her husband would pick her up, take her back to the hotel at night, bring her back the next morning, put her on the floor, and she'd stay there for another day. For seven days. In that time, she had profound encounters with Holy Spirit and the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, God took her to Heaven and He took her to the body parts room. In, the, in that room there were thousands of body parts. And He said to her, there's going to come a time when you're going to need some of these and you need to understand that they're available to you. I've given you access to the body parts you're going to need. And then he, he said to her, and, and your ministry is to the Makua people. She didn't know who the Makua people were. Never heard the name. But he was getting them ready to go back to Mozambique where they'd been before. And as a result of that profound, unbelievable, powerful encounter on the floor with Holy Spirit, they were both radically transformed. And if you hear Heidi speak, you'll think she's absolutely out of her mind. <laughs> and she would offend, offend every religious spirit in the world. But she has a powerful anointing. And as a result of what God did in their lives, and them going back to Mozambique, their ministry extends to many, many countries around the world. But in that time, they planted 10,000 churches. Thousands of People have come to know Jesus. Mozambique was and probably still is the poorest nation in the world. It's primarily Muslim. It's very, very poor. But in that time, um, and I've, I've talked to people who've been there during these times, uh, blind eyes have been opened. People who didn't have eyes received eyes. Like people with just white, white eyes. An iPhone. Uh, one of their biggest uh, miracle things is, is uh, deaf ears open. But there are people who didn't have eardrums. They have eardrums. They can hear. The dead have been raised. One night a little baby died. And uh, one of the women there in the mission said, can I, can I nurse the baby? And they prayed for the baby. And she nursed the baby all night and sang over it. 
and it was it was blue. It was dead. But in the morning, it was pink, and it was very much alive. We serve an amazing God. There's nothing He cannot do. But remember, the anointing is on your story. There's nothing He cannot do. You can tell this story and people think you're absolutely nuts. Well, God bless them, but we know it's true. We know that God can do anything. Uh, one of their workers, his name's Sapraza Satoli. Uh, he's the, I think he's like the manager of the, of the base. Uh, one night, a Muslim gang got him and bashed him uh, mercilessly to the point of death. He, you know, bones broken, he's just a terrible mess. And they thought he was dead. And whoever had him held on to him, and the next morning rang Heidi and Ron and said, you better come and get um, Satoli, he's uh, surprised that he's, he's going to die. So, but they had prayed all night. And when they went to get him in the morning, after this incredible beating and bashing, there was not a mark on his body. No bones were broken. And he got up and walked home. Praise God. We have an amazing God. Amen. Jesus. There have been many times when Heidi and Roland and the team have um, been told that like there's 250 people coming or 500 people coming, you need to prepare the food. Well, the 250 they prepared food for, 500 people came. So they just kept dishing out the food, didn't run out. 500 people came who were supposed to come, but a thousand came. They dished out the food. They had enough for the thousand. He multiplied the food. It's just amazing. Sorry, I just messed this up. Some years ago, Heidi got very ill. She, if, you, if you've met Heidi or you know her or you've read her books, she loves everybody and she hugs everybody. And she had a ministry on the rubbish dump where they lived. And it was obviously a very dirty place. And she wasn't too worried about hygiene. She didn't wash her hands. Or she hugged everybody and loved everyone, taught everyone, blessed everyone. But she got, she got a... Um, uh, like a virus, a very serious virus, it made her very, very sick. And ultimately she was taken to hospital down in Johannesburg in South Africa. And she was there for quite a while and they pumped her full of antibiotics and everything they could think of, but she wasn't, she wasn't uh, healed. And they said, look, we, we actually can't give you any hope. You're going to die. So she said, okay, well, I'm going to check myself out and I'm going to see a doctor in Toronto. So she checked herself out and uh, flew to Toronto. She was, see, she was going to see Dr. Jesus in Toronto. And they had to carry her onto the stage. She was so sick. And she began to preach. Wow. And as she preached, she was totally healed. Totally healed. There's an audio on that story, I can tell you. She was totally healed. And she's gone on to do great exploits for God ever since. Some years ago, she was asked to preach at a, at a cathedral in Germany. And, and she was told that at this service, uh, one of Germany's greatest theologians was going to be there. So, you know, she's a doctor of theology and so she constructed what she thought was a really good message that would satisfy the people that she was going to preach to but also keep the theologian happy. So she got up to preach and all she could say was too big, too small. <laughs> too big, too small. Too big, too small. And that went on for 25 minutes. And the theologian who was sitting in the congregation said, Oh, this is ridiculous. I've had enough of this. 
And he went to get up, but he was stuck to the seat. <laughs> and he couldn't move. And in the end, he said to God, I give him. <laughs> and at that moment, Heidi was released to deliver her message. Whatever the message was. And at the end of the service, he came up to her and said, Heidi, that's the best message I've ever heard. He touches the heart to offend the mind so that he might get the heart. Most of you will have heard of Reinhard Bonnke, the German preacher. Had a call in his life from being a boy and decided that, or didn't decide, God called him to minister in Germany, in South Africa, in Africa. said Africa. And so he began preaching in Africa to small groups like 500, then 1,000, maybe 10,000, maybe 5,000, maybe 10,000. And he had an amazing ministry. You've probably all heard of Kenneth Copeland as well. Word of faith man. Well, Kenneth Copeland has funded Ryan Hunt Bonke throughout his ministry. And God told Kenneth to go to Africa and meet up with Reinhardt. And he found him uh, wherever he was ministering. He had kind of a, a caravan. And, um, he said, I've, I've got a prophetic word for you, Reinhardt. He said, at the moment you're ministering to thousands. But you're going to minister to hundreds of thousands, and then you're going to minister to millions. He gave him this prophetic word. And he said, and it'll all be funded. You won't have to worry about money. And subsequently, I think one of the biggest meetings that Reinhardt spoke at was two million people. I've seen pictures of it, like faces as far as the eye can see. Two million people. And thousands and thousands came to know Jesus, documented decisions for Jesus at those meetings. During this amazing time in the, in the 90s and the 2000s, there's a church in London called uh, uh, Holy Trinity Brompton. Some of you may have heard of it. It's the church out of which the Alpha course came. And Sandy Miller was the, the minister and his offside is Nicky Gumbel. And they were both filled with the Holy Spirit as a consequence what happened in Toronto and people coming from there and ministering to them. And Alpha took on um, took on a persona all of itself, very anointed, and hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people now, as a result of doing the Alpha course, which is really introducing them to who Jesus is. Hundreds and thousands have become Christians around the world. And that, that continues around the world to this day. It's an amazing movement. It was born out of the move of the Holy Spirit in a little church at the end of the Toronto runway. Jesus said to Peter, as I told you last week, do you love me? And God said to me, as I told you last week, John, do you still love me? And Jesus would say to each one of us here today, do you love me? And we may answer as Peter, well, Lord, I have an affection for you. You know, I kind of have a brotherly love for you. But that really wasn't the question. Do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me unconditionally? That's the question. Are you hungry? The Holy Spirit. Do you have a great affection for the Holy Spirit? I was watching Bill Johnson speak just the other day and he said, Oh, I've got such an affection for the Holy Spirit. I so love him. I so love him. That's what he's looking for. I so love him. 
I can't live without him. Do you want more? Ephesians 5 8 it says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Is there a holy dissatisfaction with where you are compared to where you need to be? Isaiah 9 verse 7 says, oh, I quoted this earlier, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. With or without us, his mighty kingdom is going to continue to increase, bringing heaven to earth, light to the world, freedom for the captives. As we read in, in, in Luke 4, which I'm going to read to you this morning, <coughs> the Spirit of the Lord, we're going to read it as though you're saying it, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you and me, because he's anointed us mm-hmm. to preach the gospel to the poor. Mm-hmm. He has sent us to heal the brokenhearted, to pro- proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Do you remember that someone asked Jesus what they should do? He said, well, you need to heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, and cast out demons. Yes, but what should I do? Oh, you should heal the sick, raise the dead, (coughs) cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Oh. So what was that again? Oh, you need to raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, and heal the sick. And, And this guy asked him, well, you know, what's the greatest commandment? Well, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And your neighbor as yourself. You can only do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. You can only do that if you love Jesus unconditionally. And he begins to manifest his life through us and touch the people around us. So we can have a revival and we, we really we all actually want that but there also needs to be a reformation where we go outside the four walls of our church and we touch the world around us and ultimately visit the nations where the culture of the nation is changed and transformed how to catch the Holy Spirit when he's flowing in a gathering like this? So it's a very complex answer. The answer is, say yes. Very complex answer. Say yes. Many people will say no. Out of fear? But say yes. And not to be a spectator, but a partaker and a participant. So we need to make a choice. So next week, if I'm allowed to come back, um, the topic is how to operate and function through the Holy Spirit in a gathering. And we'll do some activation next week and watch what the Holy Spirit does among us and through us and in us and around us. And, and there'll be a lot of joy in the room. Let's all stand together. Father, we thank you that that you love us, that you have a plan for us, that before the foundation of the earth you gave us a destiny, and we want to walk in that. And we walk in that empowered by Holy Spirit. And we thank you that your kingdom is advancing. It's not dying. This is not a competition between Satan and, and God. 
Satan is a created being. You are supreme. You are the one. You are the creator. And today, Father, we, we say to you, we want more. We want to be so full of you that we radiate your love and your power and your goodness and your grace wherever we go. We radiate your love and we resonate with your love. And we know it's not something we have to try to do because it's actually happening on the inside and coming out. So Lord, we ask that your anointing will fall upon us, that you will touch us powerfully, and that we will be fully equipped to share this good news of the kingdom to a needy world who really, really, really needs to know you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.